So we're in the middle of a five-week series on topics we avoid, things we don't like to talk about. The first week was uh, religion. And really the call the first week was that we do talk about religion, that we give people authentic and compassionate. I feel really short compared to Debbie right now. Um, <laughs> that, we, that we give people uh, authentic, compassionate in, invitations to... Uh, you know, enter into the gospel with us, you know, whether it's inviting them to a worship experience, a small group experience, um, you know, serving with us uh, in missions. It's really one of the most loving, uh, compassionate things we can do. And, you know, when we do this, there's a very good chance that, you know, we're going to be part of someone's testimony. Someone is going to say, you know, I didn't really have a lot of time for religion or I was burned by the church and and -and so-and-so invited me to worship with them. And, um, you know, it just kind of clicked over the period of a few months. And, I am so grateful that that person extended that invitation to me at that time. Uh, you know, last week what we did is we talked about money. Um, you know, money is something that all of us deal with uh, every day. Um, you know, money can be um, a master that, uh, you know, we find ourselves in debt. We can, you know, find ourselves just trying to earn more to keep up with uh, the next door neighbors. But money can also be a, a wonderful resource. Um, you know, where we can enjoy this life that God gives us and we can share it with uh, others so that they may have um, some grace and compassion in their life. Uh, next week, um, we're going to talk about sex. Now, know if you have um, middle and high school kids, next week we're going to talk about sex. Um, you know, my sixth grade son will be here next week. Um, you know, I'm kind of writing this based on knowing that he's going to be here and that, uh, you know, other kids his age are going to be here, but know just next week that that is what we're going to be talking about. Um, The week after that, what we're going to be looking at is uh, death. You know, all of us uh, are going to experience this. You know, it's not the most uplifting thing to think about. We're going to experience it in our own lives. We're going to uh, experience it in the lives of loved ones. And one of the things that we can do to prepare, um, both for people that we know and for ourselves, is to talk about it. We're going to look at what the Bible uh, says about death. And any time we talk about death... um, we also have to talk about life because I don't think there's anything more that makes us think about life uh, than death itself. Now today we're going to uh, uh, talk about uh, conflict. Now one of the things you need to know is that God has created us to live in relationship with one another. In the first chapter of Genesis, uh, God created um, Adam. Now by the second chapter of Genesis... Um, God says this, it is not good for man to be alone. You know, so God got one chapter into this book, and he says, okay, Adam cannot be here by himself, so I'm going to create someone to be with Adam. People are wired to live in community. Um, Now, with that community, I will say it comes great responsibility, Because we know this is true, that this community that we have, you know, think about some of the most life-giving relationships that you have. These have been probably the biggest blessing of your life. Now, I want you to think about uh, a relationship that's had great dysfunction. You know, one that may have broke your heart, one where uh, you've been hurt more than you can imagine being hurt. Now, you know that... uh, this was no blessing at all. It was a curse. Um, you know, going through that pain, it was, it, was, it was tough. You know, we're created to live in community, but we have to know that when we're created to live in community, with this community comes responsibility. Now, <clears throat> um, when community breaks down, when this community breaks down, if, if it's uh, family, um, you know, it might be at work, uh, You know, it may be here at school. When this community breaks down, guess what happens? We break down. You know, because we're wired to be in community. Now, if you don't believe me, ask the parent who isn't getting along well with a child. And this parent will tell you exactly what I'm talking about. You ask the husband and wife who are in conflict. Ask the person who dislikes going to work every day because they're in conflict with a coworker in this conflict is unresolved in 40 hours of the week, um, you know, a little bit less for some, a little bit more for others, um, is not a happy time because there's interpersonal conflict that exists there. 
you know, you can ask the person who's just had their heart broken, and they'll tell you that with community comes responsibility. There's nothing quite like it when it's working very well, and there's nothing quite like it when it's not working at all. Now, I want to just talk about four things real quick um, that we have to know about um, community, that we have to know about interpersonal relationships, that we have to know about conflict. Number one is that conflict is inevitable. Okay, so the person that you're sitting beside right now, the person that you're holding, um, the person that you're looking at in this relationship, conflict is inevitable. Imperfect people are incapable of being in a perfect relationship. Now, imperfect people can be in a good relationship. They can be in a healthy relationship. They can be in a growing relationship. They can be in an excellent relationship. But imperfect people are incapable of being in a, imperfect, or in a perfect relationship. Therefore, conflict is inevitable. Um, number two, not all conflict can be resolved. We have to know this. Not all conflict can be resolved. Resolution... Um, it takes both parties to uh, experience resolution. Sometimes one party is neither willing nor capable of resolving the conflict, so sometimes we have to know that not all conflict can be resolved. You know, sometimes the way that we can resolve the conflict is to say goodbye. Sometimes there are necessary endings that must happen. Number three, we cannot change or control the other party. Okay, I want you to hear that one again. We cannot change or control the other party. The only thing that we can do is change and control our reaction to the other party. That's one thing that we can change. That's one thing that we can control. We can say, you know, for some reason, maybe it's me, maybe it's them, probably it's a little bit of both, we just don't get along. Yeah, there just seems to be a lot of friction. There seems to be a lot of conflict. There seems to be a lot of uh, bumping into each other. Now, I'm not going to change this person. I can't control this person. But what I can do is not let this person have power over me. I can't let this person continually ruin my day. What I can do is I can change, I can control my reaction to this person that I am in conflict with. And the fourth thing I want us to think about is relationships take a lot of work. And they take a lot of work. You know, I was, I'm doing a wedding in a couple of weeks uh, for a young couple in the church, and you know, I had met with them in my office yesterday morning, and this was exactly what we're talking about. You know, it takes a lot of work. And I looked at both of them, and I said, you know, I would rather have you fail, you know, at your business than fail this person. You know, I'd rather have you fail at the hospital, she's a nurse, you know, than to fail this man who's going to be a husband. You know, there, there's, there's choices that we have to make. And, you know, we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly on this. But we know that, like anything else, you know, if you want to be a good baseball player, what do you do? You train. You know, if you want to um, master a, a foreign language, you, you practice. You know, it, it is a logical step then that, to succeed in a relationship, it, it takes work. It takes a lot of work from, from both parties. Now, Paul is writing here in um, Ephesians uh, to a group of people who are experiencing dysfunction in their community. Now, Paul planted this church. He loved these people. You know, this is uh, in Ephesus. It's, it's part of uh, modern-day Greece. He planted this church. He had high hopes for them. And all he's hearing is that these people are uh, not getting along. Yeah, the women and the men aren't getting along. The women aren't getting along with the women. The men aren't getting along with the men. Nobody is getting along with anybody. You know, the flights were booked from Rome to Ephesus, so Paul actually did it the old-fashioned way, and he did the snail mail. He wrote a letter to them. Um, now, he, they get this letter, and, you know, when uh, Jeff was up here reading this text, you know, when I was reading this text uh, earlier this week, I was reading this stuff, and I'm like, you know, this is good stuff. As far as relational advice goes, I, I don't think I've ever seen stuff that is more prophetic and more profound than what Paul was writing to the Ephesians on that day. I believe that God was directing Paul's pen when he wrote this because uh, it, it's simple, yet it's beautiful. And if we practice this thing, again, our relationships aren't going to be perfect, but I believe that they can be growing. 
I believe that they can go from average to good. I believe that they can go from good to great. I believe that they can go from great to excellent. Because what Paul says here is what God would say about relationships. Now, the first thing that he says is in verse 25, um, to speak the truth in love. You know, Paul tells us, speak the truth in love. You know, don't speak um, lies in love. Don't speak the truth in hate. He says, speak the truth in love. Now, really, as we resolve conflict, there's, there's two ways that uh, most of us are going to resolve conflict. There's, uh, there's two ways that we do this. One is to avoid conflict, and one is to be really, really uh, assertive and, and deal with the conflict as it's uh, happening. Now, do we have any avoiders in here? Generally, about uh, 60 to 65 percent of the population um, would be considered avoiders. Um, about 35 to 40 percent of the population would be considered, um, you know, to be uh, assertive people. Now, there's not a right or a wrong way to do this. It's kind of like being right or left-handed. Um, you know, one of them is not right, unless you're a baseball player. It does help to be left-handed, but that's another story for another day. Um, now, let's just look at what it means to be. Um, of an avoider. Now, there's a strength to being an avoider. You know what the strength is? The strength is, is that you're not resolving the conflict as it's happening. What you can do is you can take a step back, or you can take two steps back. And you can say, you know, I'm, I'm going to think about this one for a little bit. Yeah, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to get some advice from some other people. Um, I'm going to cool down. And then when I'm ready, I'm going to uh, go to the other party. And that person and I are going to have a conversation. Um, now, there's also a, a dark side to avoiding, and many of us uh, who are avoiders, we're aware of what this is. And that is that we just get these layers and layers and layers of unresolved conflict, and all of a sudden it just gets to be a little bit too much for us. You know, the temptation is that we never resolve the thing because it makes us feel un very uncomfortable to have these conversations. Now, if you're an avoider, you probably felt pretty good after you've had some uh, tough conversations before. You probably thought to yourself, you know, I wonder why we didn't talk about this a long time ago. I've been kind of carrying this, this mess with me, and it was actually a fairly easy conversation. I don't know why I didn't do this. Now, the assertive person is a little bit different. The, uh, the good side of being an assertive person is you don't get those layers and layers of conflict that are, that are swept under the rug. You're pretty much dealing with stuff as it happens. Now, the challenge of being an assertive person is a lot of times you're, you're dealing with the conflict at the same time you're still processing it. You know, a lot of times you're speaking with your heart, not your head. And if you're a really assertive person, you'll probably be the first person to admit that there's uh, been words that you just wish you could have taken back. You know, things that you said that you just wish you uh, wouldn't have, that you, know, you weren't thinking quite as uh, clearly as you could. Now, so you have to know this. In your relationship with other people, you have to know who you are and who the person uh, you're in a, rela a relationship is with. So say, for example, if uh, you're an avoider and you're in a, um, a relationship with a very assertive person, you know that you have a responsibility to that other person to give them some resolution to the conflict because this is something that they need. Now, if you're an avoider and you're in a relationship with another avoider, um, the easy temptation is uh, for both of you to avoid, not deal with the issues that you have. And it's kind of like this. Have you ever seen like a, like a boiling pot of water and you got a lid on it? And like you put uh, like a weight on the lid. Once you take the weight off, the lid is just going to blow up. And probably this has happened to some of us. We haven't dealt with the conflict that we need to deal with and, and things just blew up. You know, now if you're an assertive person, and you're in a relationship uh, with an avoider, you know that you have to give that person a little bit of space. You know, you, know you, you need to give them a little bit of time to process, a little bit of time to think, a little bit of time to pray. You know, and then uh, my favorite ones uh, are the assertive person and the assertive person. You know, like if you watch like the Real Housewives of uh, Los Angeles or the Real Housewives of like New York or Omaha or whatever the cities are right now, um, the producers of these shows, these guys aren't dummies. Um, they're finding very assertive people because they know that when two assertive people have conflict, it's going to be very entertaining. And uh, when you're in a, a relationship with another assertive person, um, 
you know that probably it's going to be best for both of you to just kind of take a step back and, you know, it's kind of like this, like, I tell this story to couples I'm going to marry sometimes. It's like if you're driving home from church, let's just say you're going to um, uh, Dodge in like 180th or something like that. Let's say you get to uh, Pacific in 180th and your light's green. Now, you have every right to go through that stoplight, don't you? Because it's green. Now, let's say on Pacific uh, from the west, there comes this great big 18-wheel tractor trailer. Now, his light's red, but he doesn't appear to be slowing down. Now, you get to the intersection, and your light is still green. He gets to the intersection, and his light is still red. He's not slowing down. You have every right to go through that stoplight. Now, at this point, you have a choice. You can go through the stoplight and get run over by the 18-wheel tractor trailer. You can tow your car and do a whole lot worse, or you can actually stop. And you can say, my life is worth more than being right. You know, sometimes in our relationships, we're just going to get to those uh, intersections. You know, we've already maybe said some hurtful things. Maybe we've thought some hurtful things. Maybe we're just not in a good place where we can listen to the other person. We get to that stoplight, and we have to stop, even though our light's green. Because we know that's better than the alternative. The alternative is something like this. You know, we see on our grave side, you know, Craig, he ran through the green light. He was right. Well, he's also dead. <laughs> you know, sometimes in our relationships, we get to the green light and we have to stop. All right, so, um, Paul can, he, he, he hits everything here. Love this text. Verse 26, um, have a healthy response to your anger. Uh, Paul specifically says, in your anger, do not sin. Now, anger happens, and we have to know that anger is an emotion that God gives to us. Sometimes anger is good. You know, anger is one of the things that can cause people to strive for justice in the world that we live in. The Bible tells us, in fact, that Jesus himself got angry. Do you guys remember what, why he got angry? They were uh, uh, changing money in the temple, in the synagogue. And, and Jesus, he went, up to the, he went up to one of the people that had uh, money on their table. He tossed the table over. He says, what are you guys doing? This is my father's house. It's, it's a house of prayer. You know, so Jesus got angry. There was a day um, in the history of our con- uh, country, a, name, a woman by the name of Susan B. Anthony got angry. And she got angry because women couldn't vote. And she didn't see this as a good thing. And she got angry and she did something about it. And today, women can vote. In the history of our country, there was a man whose name was Martin Luther King. And he got very angry. But his anger was a just anger. He got angry because a portion of our population was not being treated as a full person. So he got angry and he, he did something about it in a very just way. Yeah, there's a woman um, whose name is uh, Nancy Goodman Brinker. Many of you uh, probably don't know who she is, but you know the work that she's done. Uh, she's the sister of a woman whose name is uh, Susan Komen, who died of breast cancer at age 33. There was a day that she got angry, that women uh, you know, should not have to go through this. So she started this uh, series of Races for the Cure. And in these uh, years, in these decades since this, has raised millions and millions and, and millions of dollars for breast cancer research. Anger can be a very good thing. Now, as I say that, we have to know, and we've all experienced this, the anger of other people and the anger of ourselves, anger can be a very bad thing. You know, we can get angry at, you know, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the silliest things. You can get angry at hitting a golf shot. And you can ruin um, an entire afternoon. You know, you're out there in this beautiful green place. You're out there with some friends. You hit a bad shot. Does the anger ruin the day? You know, we can get uh, angry at being stuck in traffic. We can be angry at the, at the house not being totally clean when we get home. We can be angry at uh, the server messing up our order at a restaurant. Now, this is not the type of anger that leads toward systems of justice. This is the type of petty anger that can just chip away at us. You know, a lot of times it's not that great big hill of a, uh, it's going to wear us out. It's going to be the, the pebble in our shoe. Now, for many of us, it's going to look a little bit different. Um, maybe somebody has labeled you. Or somebody uh, called you a name. 
You know, maybe somebody has misunderstood you. Maybe someone has broken a promise that they've made. Maybe um, somebody has not lived up to your expectations. Now, Paul knows. Paul knows because he's experienced it, that, that, that anger is a natural response that we have. So Paul says that there's nothing that we can do. It's a natural emotion. It's something that we're going to experience. What matters is how we respond to the anger, especially the unjust anger that I'm talking about. Paul says the response to anger is what is critical. Healthy responses, what they do is they lead to justice and they lead to peace. Unhealthy responses to anger, what they do is they lead to injustice and dysfunction. Now, Frederick Buechner, he's a um, writer. He's probably, I think, in his 80s or 90s now. Sometimes he describes uh, things just so clearly. And here's what he says about anger. He says, of the seven deadly sins, anger is probably the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past. To roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come. To savor, to savor the last uh, toothsome morsel, both the pain you are given and the pain you are given back. In many ways, it is a feast that's fit for a king. The chief drawback is that you are wolfing down yourself. The skeleton that you feast upon is you. Now, I want you to think about this. And this is why Paul talks about this. Of your anger, who is uh, the primary recipient of that? Who is hurt most by your anger? Well, it's going to be the people that you're around the most. It's going to be the people that you love the most. And ultimately, um, it's going to be you yourself. You know, uh, Paul gives us these beautiful words. He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. You know, another, way, another translation says, don't go to bed when you're angry. Now listen, here, here's how we do it. If there are systems of injustice... And if that makes us angry, what we do is we do something about it. You know, if it's petty, what we do is we let it go. If there's a misunderstanding, and all the avoiders like me need to listen to this one, what we do is we work it out. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. All right, the third thing, um, we find this one in verse 28. Don't take from people and add, uh, don't take from people, but what we do instead is we add value to people. Now, Paul specifically says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own heads so that they may have something to share with those in need. Now, probably what Paul was talking about was um, in ancient Greece, people would take uh, baths in public bathhouses. It was kind of like the, the fitness clubs of, uh, of our day. And what would happen is it would be very common um, for theft to happen in these uh, public bathhouses. Now, I don't think that physical theft is really the thing that most of us have to worry about. I think in our culture today, we're not uh, you know, stealing tangible, physical, monetary items um, from other people. But what I do think can happen is that we can steal self-esteem from people by belittling them. We can steal the dreams of people and the hopes of people by trying to control them. We can steal emotional health from people by manipulating them. So what Paul says at the end is, is do something useful and share with those people in need. So point number four then lends to this. Use your words to construct and not destruct. So verse 29, it says, do not let... And, Think about this. Think about the words that we say. You know, I want to really challenge, uh, challenge some of us to, to, to listen and practice this one. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. You know, I'll tell you this, and you already know this. I'm going to tell you something that you already know. You know that words are powerful. You know that words are power. I, I, I think of uh, you know, my relationship with my dad, and I think about my relationship with my grandpa. And I can tell you some of the most powerful words that I've experienced you know, were good job. 
Yeah, you, you, you worked hard on this, and you did it. I'm proud of you. You know, I can also tell you in my life, um, not necessarily my grandpa or my dad, but I can tell you in my life that some of the most painful times that I can remember are words that were uh, not life-giving at all. Yeah, you messed that up. Um, yeah, you're not good enough. You know, what negative words are going to do um, is they're going to chip away at our self-esteem. They're going to chip away at the self-esteem of other people. We're stealing that from them. You know, negative uh, words are going to diminish the dreams of people and take some of their hope away. Negative words are going to threaten um, emotional health. Positive words. Think about positive words. What words can we say to the people that we love the most to build their self-esteem? What words can we say to the people that we care about the most to, to complete strangers, not to diminish their dreams, but to help them have their dreams come true? What words can we say as children of God and brothers and sisters to Jesus Christ to add to the emotional health and wellness of other people? Yo, know, I once had a bishop in Iowa. Um, and... Basically, you know, we had appointments every year, and I told him for you know, two years in a row, I said, I want to start a church. I want to be part of a church that uh, uh, you know, starts some kind of new ministry. I don't feel led to you know, serve uh, existing churches. Um, it's just not what I'm really wired for, I don't think. And three years in a row, um, he told me, he says, Craig, you're not good enough. You don't have what it takes. You know what, I believed him. You know, for a couple of years, I believed him. And I don't know, like, maybe he, uh, you know, didn't know me, maybe he didn't have opportunities, I don't know why he said what he said. But every time I'd hear those words, my heart would just, it would sink into my stomach. Yeah, you know, I remember those negative words, and you remember those negative words too, and we can do something about it. Maybe we haven't used words best in the past. Maybe today is the day we start doing that. You know, to, to make people's dreams come true, to build their self-esteem, to add value to their emotional health. You can change the way that you use your words. Now, it keeps getting better here. Um, Paul says in verse 31, um, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with uh, every form of malice. You know, what he's basically saying here is don't hold grudges. Don't hold grudges against yourself and don't hold grudges against other people. It's kind of like this. If, uh, do we have any like backpackers or, or campers in here? You know like on the um, first day of the journey, you got this great big backpack and it's full of gear and it's full of food and you probably have some water in there as well. Well, the second day it gets a little bit lighter. The third day it gets a little bit lighter. And by the end of the week, um, your backpack is pretty light. Now, it's kind of counterintuitive. You think after five or six days uh, out in the wilderness, that it actually gets tougher. But it actually gets easier because you're carrying less burdens. You have less baggage. Now think about that. In relationships with other people, what we have to do is we have to get rid of the grudges. We have to get rid of the rage and the anger. Um, Brawling probably isn't an issue for too many of us, but we get rid of the slander and um, every form of malice. God does not intend for us uh, to carry these burdens. Many times we've talked about right here at this church, uh, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Give them to me. Take them to the altar, and I will give you rest. I'll give you rest for your souls. God does not intend for us to carry hurts. God does not uh, intend for us to carry our failures. What God intends for us to do is to lay them down at the altar that Jesus has taken care of for us and, and look forward and start fresh every day anew. Yeah, the... uh, He's got a couple more to go. Uh, verse 32. Um, Paul says, be kind to others. You know, be kind to others. I'm going to tell you the difference between being kind and uh, being nice. You know, being nice, it, it's just, uh, it could be a kind act that we do for somebody. But the biblical definition of kindness is that we offer somebody grace with no expectation of return. You know, basically, we, we help somebody, and we don't care if they can help us back or not. We do it because it's the right thing to do. We don't do it because of them. We do it because of us and who God is in us and through us. You know, um, a great definition of, uh, a great illustration of kindness in the Bible is when Mephibosheth. Okay, so Mephibosheth is, uh, he's crippled. Um, he's young. 
He's been damaged. He was raised without parents. Um, he was hiding out because he knew the king was going to kill him. David, uh, you know, goes out and finds Mephibosheth. He brings him to the castle. Mephibosheth knew that he was going to die because he was part of the uh, ruling family before David. In that generation, what they did is they killed the entire family so there'd be no um, upheaval or uprising in the future. But the Bible says that David didn't do that. What David did is he helped this helpless boy. He says, you know, from now on, Mephibosheth, you're going to eat with me. You're going to feast with my family at my table. It was kindness at its finest. Mephibosheth could do absolutely nothing for David, but David did anyway because of a promise that David made. And uh, the next one is in verse 32, be ca uh, compassionate to others. Now what comp uh, compassion is, um, it's the capacity for feeling what it's like to live inside somebody else's skin. It's the knowledge that there can never be any peace and joy for me until there is peace and joy for you. Now think about this in the relationships that, uh, that you're in. It's kind of like this old uh, fable. You know, the man fell into the pit and he couldn't get himself out um, you know, the Pharisee says, well, only bad people fall into pits. The map, mathematician says, you know, he, he's trying to figure out how deep the pit is. Um, the fire and brimstone preacher says, you deserve your pit. Uh, the, psycholo the psychologist says, you know, your mother and father are to blame for the pit that you're in. The optimist says that it could be worse. The pessimist uh, says that it, uh, the optimist says it could be worse. The pessimist says that it's going to get worse. But what the compassionate person does is he goes to the pit, he throws down a rope, and he helps the person out of the pit. Now I'd say in your life, um, who was in the pit? And instead of analyzing it, um, instead of giving advice, how, what, what's the rope that you can throw down to help somebody out of the pit? The last one, and I, th I think Paul did this intentionally, um, I think he saved this one for last because he wanted people to remember it the most. Um, Paul says in verse 32, be forgiving of others. Um, be forgiving of others. And what I want to do is have us think about Jesus here for a moment. Um, Jesus forgives you of your sin. Jesus forgives me of my sin. Now I want you to think of you at your absolute worst. Think about you at your absolute worst. You know, maybe there's... Uh, just been some inner struggles you've had or some, some gossip or something you did that a hundred times out of a hundred, you wish you could do it over again. Think of you at your worst. Now know that Jesus forgives you for this. You know, with, with no strings attached, he expects nothing from us. He forgives you. He forgives us because of the love of the Father, of the love of the Son, and the love of the Holy Spirit. Now we are created to be like God. We are constantly being recreated into the image of Christ himself. You know, just like we can experience healing in our relationship with Christ, we can experience healing in our relationship with others through, uh, through forgiveness. So let's uh, go to God and let's pray. Lord.